You are listening to the We Need to Talk About Tasker podcast, and this is our first Rewind episode with DP Paul Cameron for the 20th anniversary of the release of Man on Fire and Collateral. The Orange Cab in Collateral, I shot 26 tests of that color to get the color of that cab. That's the kind of persistence that I'm used to with filmmakers. And even the ones that aren't that, they're persistent in other ways. They're persistent in emotional ways of like getting to the truth of something, you know? And I think it's a big question. We have this tradition on the show that as a conversation starter, we tend to ask our guests to turn back the wheel of time and tell us about not even how they got into filmmaking, but rather how they fell in love with films. So, Paul, what's your story? Ah, how I fell in love with films. I think in a, in a bizarre way, kind of growing up in New York City, I kind of fell in love with films, watching certain films being made. You know, I saw, you know, the likes of Scorsese and Coppola and everybody on the streets of New York, Woody Allen filming. And I saw this kind of crazy, magical troupe running around on the streets doing crazy things and started going to a lot of movies with my brother, who was an actor at the time, and I was living with him. And I just started to fall in love watching movies in New York and watching them getting made. And next thing you know, it was on the path, you know. I mean, it's quite the start, too see the ones like Scorsese. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> now I get it all. <laughs> no, no, it was good. It was a good time in New York. There was a lot of great productions on the streets and uh, you could really watch some great, great filmmaking being made. Even though partially the reason for our conversation today is the fact that both Collateral and Man on Fire came out 20 years ago in 2004, um, I don't want this to be another anniversary edition where we just revisit projects with our guests as i'm sure you've received loads of questions already about these two for example however what i want to spend some time with are to appoint your memories experiences on these projects and basically how you look back on them so first of all how do these two films in particular relate to one another in your mind now and in your memories and how did they do back then, 20 years ago? Well, it's interesting, Aaron. I think the two films, for me, they, on many levels, they were collisions, artistic collisions with directors that were very good timing for me. You know, working with Tony Scott first on, on Men on Fire, you know, this was kind of this um, explosion of, of celluloid, right? Like we jumped into this kind of visual palette of hand cranking and, and saturated film stocks and cross-processing and developed this kind of insane palette to tell the story. And then, you know, while I was making that film, I got a call to go meet Michael Mann and went up and met with him. And, you know, he offered me collateral. and you know, for me, that was uh, like this other collision of, of talent in a way where that was kind of extreme, you know, because, you know, Michael, we, we, we suddenly started walking the streets at night in Los Angeles, which are, you know, this kind of sodium light and green metal highlight light and, you know, the glowing cypress trees against, you know, the, this Los Angeles urban landscape that you could see by your eye, but you couldn't get on film. And, you know, we started going down the road of this kind of digital camera reality where Michael had shot some stuff with the Sony 950 for Ali in a TV show he was doing. And we had, uh, Michael had a new, I think it was a Canon, a brand new digital SR camera, like the first one. And I actually had like this like tiny uh, digital Casio credit card camera that was about, you know, uh, six kilobytes or something ridiculously but could really read into the night and create these incredible images. And, and when I printed them on good paper, it looked like film grain. But, you know, basically, you know, we, we were kind of going down this path of, of creating this world that we could see by our eye that had this kind of acidic, acrid quality to it, you know. So, so how these films relate, I mean, 
they're just, you know, collisions with filmmakers and, 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 you know, different palettes. And, and I think, you know, fortunately as a cinematographer in, in one year, I was like, you know, jumping on these two different paths that were so extreme and, and it was just fortunate paths, you know. Fascinating. And now that you mention the level of talent, the two films, yeah, start Denzel Washington and Tom Cruise, who were two of the biggest movie stars back then. And by now, they might be the only two standing. They are still quite big box office draws. I mean, one might say that you can still sell tickets solely with the name of, I don't know, DiCaprio or Brad Pitt, plus Glenn Powell might have the potential as well nowadays. But still. So after having worked with many of the biggest names, what's your stance on this whole status and this whole movie star thing from from the other side of the camera well i think it's you know it's undeniable when you're photographing you know a scene with an actor and it's just this again this kind of insane undeniable reality of a performance and having worked with many top actors that you mentioned including denzel and, and tom cruise you know, the, these are levels of performances that you just don't get from other actors you know, that may be considered a level actors, but they they're just exuding a certain energy and behavior and we're capturing it. You can't believe how insanely wonderful it is. Right. In terms of status, it's like um, Denzel, very successful, many, many movies, Tom, incredibly successful, many, many movies. Can you put names on a, on a film and put them out there and have people go to them? Yeah, I think we've proven, you know, there's a certain amount of people that will always go to see certain actors. But I think, you know, we're also in a time where that's less real. And there was a reason why in the 40s and 50s in Hollywood that the studios put actors on contracts and kept them there. And because they made the movies and people kept seeing those, wanted to go see, you know, the same actors in, in the movies. and. And now, you know, some of these actors do remain at the same studios for the most part, like Tom, the, you know, many, many films of Paramount, whatever. But the paradigm is broken. You know, I think it's no longer, you know, you can't just put these names in a movie and guarantee people to go to the movie theater anymore. You're more guaranteed to get people to turn on a streaming show with their names on it. And that's a, it's a much different thing. But it comes down to the, the performance, you know. <laughs> The box office is one thing, but that's, the, like I said, that's changed, you know. Yeah, and I mean, for me, there is this little controversy in it, I don't know, commercially or for the audience, how nowadays it feels like that the audience itself is looking for newer and newer faces, yet in those newer and newer faces, they are looking for the same. Mm. I don't know if that makes sense, but somehow it's just, <laughs> it's kind of how it feels. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny that, you, you know, when we think about it, it's like you want a person, an, an actor who can play many different parts and yet you want to go see them do another part, another part and another part. And I think it's, you know, when you see the Daniel Day Lewis's and DiCaprio's and all the major actors out there, that the level of craft they put into each character, you know, female, male across the board is kind of insane it's mesmerizing you know and i think that's that's the other thing is like going to see an actor um, in one film and then seeing them in another film and have them transform themselves completely to see like brendan fraser you know be in the whale and play that character and transform himself like that just amazing you know actors do amazing things you know and and for me that's been the joy over the years filming so many of these actors is working with them a few of them on um, numerous occasions. And now that I'm starting to direct them, working with them as a director and directing them. And that's been a fabulous thing as well. But I guess what you're getting at, which is the interesting thing is like, why do we want to see the same person play different parts <laughs> as opposed to new people playing new parts and, and exchanging it? I don't know. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. And both Collateral and Men on Fire, for me, has something to do or say about among many other things, but this is the first that just pops into my head. Persistence. Steering our conversation back to you. What does persistence mean to you and to your work specifically? 
Well, persistence, I think it's like, it's something that began on the, you know, as soon as I got into this craft and moved forward in it, it's just this undeniable pursuit for magic and truth and art reality. But, you know, the real persistence factor is really like a based on discipline. And that's kind of, um, you know, been a big thing for me as discipline in the craft and forcing myself to see hundreds and hundreds of films when I was a student and still going to, you know, hundreds of films in a year and maintaining a level of inspiration and maintaining knowledge of the craft. And there's just this like never letting go factor of having to have the knowledge and the inspiration as much as possible. You know, when you talk about persistence in these films, they were persistent filmmakers. And I think that's also been the attraction too, in that, you know, somebody like Tony was really going for the, you know, wanted to get to the gut of this Denzel character, to the heart of this guy's broken soul. And Michael's pursuit of telling this story about this insane contract killer and relationship with, you know, the Jamie Foxx character over in night in Los Angeles and this urban landscape and trying to recreate this feeling overnight. And I will tell you persistence from somebody like Michael, I'll tell you a very quick story. The orange cab in Collateral, I shot 26 tests of that color to get the color of that cab. That's the kind of persistence that I'm used to with filmmakers. And even the ones that aren't that they're persistent in other ways. They're persistent in emotional ways of like getting to the truth of something, you know, and I think it's a big question. Good. <laughs> and you've alluded to it to a point that since then you've heard on TV shows like Westward, Lioness or Mare of Kingstown as a director. How was the transition from director of photography to director? I think the transition has been great. You know, part of me wish I started directing earlier, but then there's a big part of me that understands why I started directing when I started directing. And I feel the transition has been very natural. Um, I've always been talking to actors. I've always been around the camera on set. And again, you know, you, you, you finish shooting a scene and oftentimes the actors, the first person they look at is the one behind the camera. And I feel like I've been there for many actors and talked to many actors about stories with directors throughout the years. So I feel like, you know, the transition has been kind of natural that way. I think that it's a new great challenge for me because how to deal with story and structure of story and, and character. And then in particular with streaming is much different because it's not just this two hour reality. It's this one hour reality of a reality that might be part of 10 episode reality that might be part of an eight year arc reality. <laughs> so the characters where they're at, the showrunners, the way they work, how the structure of the shows are, that to me has been a, a really interesting challenge. And I never really shot TV. I shot a few pilots here and there. I kind of kept out of shooting streaming and, you know, was much happier shooting films and the core of the work I really enjoy, and I think it's the story and it's the and it's working with actors, trying to find the truth of the words and the characters and to kind of birth it along with them is the kind of thing that I'm really enjoying about it. And do you see a difference in your framing and general approach to the whole directing part of it from the not DP turned directors? Well, I think the interesting thing here is like to have the experience I've had as a cinematographer. It's fabulous on one side because I see things visually and I see ultimately how to edit them. And I kind of feel like I know what shots I need or don't need, you know, but then the downside of that is that, you know, I'm not a newbie director coming in and just saying, show me, you know, a different and, and going down a path. So I think on the first side of that, I'm leaning to pushing things toward the way I'm used to shooting things, which can be good and bad. But the good part of it is that I can go fast through some things and, and I know how to manage time and how I can give myself and or actors the right time in certain scenes to kind of work through it because of the demanding schedules that we have. So that's been very, very positive. And just to return to the two films we've talked about earlier for a moment, that have their 20th anniversaries. They were helmed by two immensely talented and legendary directors, the late Tony Scott and Michael Mann. Is there 
anything that you might have taken with yourself from these collaborations that you might have been able to incorporate into your directing style or just general work as a director? Oh, yeah, for sure. I think, you know, specifically with Tony Scott, we used a lot of cameras, you know, and I think it was a time where Tony was using more and more cameras. And then, you know, I had done a couple of films with, you know, shooting two, three cameras and suddenly four cameras. And now suddenly we're on a set and we're shooting six, seven, eight cameras. And it was this kind of like symphonic style of shooting in a way. And I think I kind of incorporated that into my style in a lot of ways, which is kind of frightening for some cinematographers because I can kind of see like, you know, I know I can do two, three cameras here and one or two over here and I'm listening to the lines and I know the lines or the behavior of that moment I'm going to use from that camera and I'm not going to use the rest of it. And then I'm going to use this one over here. And that's a certain style that I think I carried over from Tony quite a bit. And then specifically from Michael is probably this pursuit of kind of the truth of an image, you know, the kind of simplicity of the truth of one image. Michael would, would be so focused on every aspect of one particular image, you know, and I think that, you know, to have this balance of, you know, wanting to shoot something with, you know, six to eight cameras and then wanting to find the one shot, if it could only have one shot for this sequence, has been kind of a great, a great balance for me because I oftentimes put myself you know, not necessarily thinking about these two filmmakers, but now that you bring it up, it is it is kind of that balance of like, this is the way I'm used to playing the song and I'm familiar with it and I know how to get to the end, end notes here. <laughs> but what is, you know, what is the complete opposite of that to get to the same place and then trying to find find the truth somewhere in the middle of it, directing. Incredible. And of course, without naming names or anything, I'm sure... There must have been many things that might have annoyed you in a director as a DP. Now directing, do you ever catch yourself like, oh crap, I'm doing it. <laughs> oh yeah. Unfortunately, I torture all the cinematographers I, I work with. I just can't not torture them. It's, you know, I try to empower, empower and inspire as much as possible, but um, I can't help myself in a lot of ways. And yeah, and I think the other hard part is, you know, for, you know, working as a director and it's not just a cinematographer, but it's for everybody. It's for the people doing makeup and the, the props and dressing and grips and the whole crew when you're being, when you know you're out of time and you're like, you asked to make a compromise. And that's like the hardest thing for me to do is to go to a crew member and just were to have to say something when I know somebody's doing something that's unnecessary for the shot that I'm doing to kind of stop the activity so I can actually turn the camera on and start shooting. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, there's like, I can make you a list of probably a couple pages long there. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> yeah. And probably for me, the most burning question out of all, and Sure, it's not black and white. It's rather quite a fine line. But do you still see yourself as a cinematographer first? Or what's your perception of your own place between crafts and in the industry as a whole? Ah, well, you know, I think it's like I see myself as a split personality. You know, I can't I can't deny, you know, the, the decades of, of work as a cinematographer you know, having shot a number of films and I would say thousands of commercials and hundreds of videos. And I can't deny that as part of myself and, and my career. And then this kind of redefining myself as a director is, is a new thing. You know, I feel like I've been very fortunate because I've worked on some very good shows with top actors and I love working with top actors and being in the, in that realm, but it's, until I make a film as a director, until I make a couple of films as a director, will, will I feel like I have a voice, like the way I felt I had a voice as a cinematographer? That's yet to be determined, you know, because as wonderful as it is to work in the streaming, it's different than kind of writing, you know, or directing your own, or writing and directing your own film that way, you know. So I hope I have the opportunity to do a film or two. And if not, I love the craft and will continue directing and 
you know, hope to get a call from, you know, there's a couple of films that I'm very interested in shooting and would go back and shoot in a heartbeat with some directors and the doors open, you know, it's who are the most interesting people in projects right now? And, and it's a good place to be. So I feel fortunate. And as far as I know, your next project is Terminal is Dark Wolf, of which I'm sure you can't say too much. Yeah. But what is it that caught your attention about the project back when you boarded it? Well, you know, it's interesting. I was working on Lioness and um, there was a, a gentleman, an actor and advisor on it, Jared Shaw, who mentioned the show, The Terminalist, that he was working on as a writer and it was also an actor. And it had just come out on Amazon and we were filming Lioness. And I said, just I'll catch up with it. When I finished, I sat down and I was going to watch an episode and suddenly it was two episodes, three episodes. And then I finished the whole series and I was very attracted to the show and I called Jared up and, and just said, you know, it was a wonderful show. You did a really great job with it. It was a surprise. And thanks for, you know, pointing me that direction. And, and he said, well, you know, we're doing this prequel to it. Would you be interested in directing on that as well? And I said, yeah, I would love to, you know. So I met with Dave DeGilio, the showrunner, and, and Red Toy, the producing director, and a few people, and Kat Semek over with Anton Fuqua's company. And, you know, I read the scripts and I was just very attracted to, you know, this Taylor Kish's character and the two screenplays that I read that were the pilot and the, the second episode. And the idea for the prequel just was a very interesting emotional pursuit of this character that I was attracted to. So luckily they hired me. So um, yeah, I'm just finishing it up. We're going to head back next month and got about a week to go shooting, but it's been a great experience and just finished editing both the episodes for the most part and um, I'm looking forward to finishing them. And of course, I can't not ask it. How was the shoot in Hungary as that's where I'm originally from and that's where I currently am as well. Is it shot solely in a studio or did you have the chance to shoot on some locations? Uh, we filmed Terminalist in um, mostly locations in Budapest, which are fantastic. A lot of really, really fabulous locations. And, you know, that's a big thing for me is like really digging in with the scout and the production designer. And I just, you know, and it's funny on streaming, you you know, you, you've got, you know, roughly 15 days to get a couple episodes together. And on this, I just, I hit the ground and I just was punching on the location, location, location. And by the end of the first week, I think I had 90% of my locations and they were great. And I was thrilled. And then we shot it for a bit in uh, some stages and, you know, some warehouse type stages, not the main studio there. But that went very well. And I, and I have to say that the Hungarian crew that we had was absolutely amazing. I mean, top shelf worldwide. You know, we were so fortunate between, you know, the sets and the set dressing to the, the gaffing, the gripping and focus pullers and operators and every craft person we had and assistant directors and just a wonderful group of people in Budapest. So, you know, we feel really fortunate and can't wait to get back to finish it. And when do you think we can expect to see it? Terminalist Dark Wolf will come out next summer, I think, on Amazon. I think that's their goal. I know we're finishing and delivering it quickly, but I, I have a feeling Amazon's not going to put it out till next year from what I hear. So I think you're going to have to wait till next summer in 2025 and uh, look forward to seeing it then. Budapest and all glory, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Paul. Thank you so much for your time and for these lovely stories and for your insights. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thanks for the great opportunity. It was good to speak with you and, and best of luck on the podcast. Thanks so much. Take care. Yes, bye-bye.